Good morning, and welcome to Art and Science. Today we are inspired by the world of Jan Brett at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. And the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts and the William Bush Planetarium have teamed up today to bring you this live presentation. Today's presentation has been inspired by the current exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts in Washington County, uh, The World of Jan Brett, and we will focus on the illustrations from Who's That Knocking on Christmas Eve? These are some of the wonderful illustrations on view right now. And we're gonna take a look, if you look in the background here, you can see up in the sky, a very amazing phenomenon that really happens in real life. And that's called the Aurora Borealis. And we'll get a chance to hear about this story a little more towards the end of our presentation today. And we'll get a chance to see these paintings in the book as well. And we are going to find out how that really naturally occurs. Uh, the Aurora Borealis, how does it really happen? And what does it really look like? We are going to ask an expert today, an expert that we have here with us from the William Bush Planetarium. We're gonna welcome Alicia Ron. Uh, Alicia is the current STEM Planetarium resource teacher at the William Bush Planetarium and former Earth Science Space Science teacher at the Smithsburg High School. She is also chairsperson for the Tri-State Astronomers Amateur Astronomy Club. When not at school, she enjoys spending time with her husband and three greyhounds. That's a full house. <laughs> Alicia, welcome. And thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you because I know you've got some really special things planned for us today. Okay, well, thank you, Kelly. I'm really happy to be here today. There's nothing more exciting than looking at the Aurora Borealis and being able to see it. Um, unfortunately for us, most of the time, here in Maryland, we don't get to see the Aurora Borealis because it doesn't come this far south. Um, in 19, I believe 90, 1991, I was able to see it in Carlisle, Pennsylvania because we had an outrageous solar storm happen at that point. And if I was you, I would immediately wonder, well, what in the world does having a big solar storm have to do with the Aurora Borealis. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about today. Why do we experience an Aurora Borealis? You can see behind me, I have a picture of the Aurora and it shows you what we come to um, recognize and be excited about with the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights as they're called. They're all different colors. We've got some greens down here in the lower atmosphere. Um, when we get to the, the middle atmosphere, we have some purples and we have some blues, as you can see over on the other side. And also at the very top, over in the corner, we have some more green mixing in, which gives us that beautiful kind of turquoise color. Well, why do we have all of those colors in our atmosphere and what does the sun have to do with it? Well, that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. And there's no better way to talk about the Aurora Borealis and why it happened than to draw it. So that's what I'm going to do with you while I'm talking today. I have some pastel artist chalk that I'm going to be drawing with. Um, you really can use sidewalk chalk. You can use whatever chalk you have handy. Um, I also have black paper. If you don't have black paper, you can use white paper. You could use um, brown paper, you have brown paper. You could even take, if you have some black paint, some white paper, paint it black, and then use your chalk on top of that, all right? Um, and I've got all of these wonderful colors, right? And we love colors. Unfortunately, we don't get to use them all because we're gonna talk about the scientific reason behind the colors that we see so what makes it happen to you? Well, out in the sky, right, during the day, you can see that big yellow thing that we call the sun. And I'm sorry for turning my back on you, I don't mean to, um, but I can't go on. Okay. The sun, we usually call 
color it yellow because there are different colors of stars. Stars give off energy, all right, in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? Now, what is the electromagnetic spectrum? It's the colors that we see in a rainbow. So if you think about the colors we see in a rainbow, do you guys know the guy whose name is Roy G. Biv? His name is Roy G. Biv. Those are the colors of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Okay? So stars give off energy in these color categories. The sun happens to give off energy in the yellow category. Now, when that energy comes to us here on Earth, it bounces off of objects and does what we call illuminate them. And that's why you can see things during the day. Because those particles come to Earth, they bounce off of objects. And that helps you see that object. It doesn't happen at night, does it? Because the sun is not out. Now the moon is out at night, correct? And the moon gives off light, but the moon is not giving off its own light. It's not creating energy and light like the sun is. It's only reflecting light from the sun. So there's a big difference between seeing during the day and seeing at night. During the day we see because these particles come to Earth and bounce off the Earth. At night, particles from the moon are being reflected we know on a full moon it's nice, right? Because there's a little more energy reflected back to us. Okay? Well, we keep saying Earth. This the sun is giving off particles that come to the Earth. Well, the Earth is right here in the way of the sun. Okay? And I colored it blue because it's got so much ocean, it's got so much water. But we also have land on the earth, okay? So we might want to put some brown on here for land. Okay. And it also has an axis. The earth is tilted, right? It's tilted at 23 and a half degrees. Why? Probably because it got hit by a really big asteroid at some point in time that made it tilt. But it also has clouds. So when we start to look at the Earth, this great big beautiful blue marble, that's kind of what we're looking at. Okay. Well, when we talk about the particles coming from the sun, where do they come from? Did you know that if you look at the sun, it's not always just yellow. It gets these things on it called sunspots. Sunspots, they sound like they should be hot areas, don't they? It's a sunspot. But they're not. They're actually cooler areas on the sun. For the last year-ish, year or so, we haven't had a lot of sunspots. We're getting more and more back right now. So we were at what is called a solar minimum, where there was not much solar activity. Now we're getting more and more. So when we look at the sun, see those black spots? And do you remember? We just said the sun is always giving off particles that are coming towards the earth. And that's what helps us see. Because as those particles come to the earth, as we said, they bounce off of things like trees or grass or houses and they bounce into your eye and that helps you to see them, right? But sometimes where we have these sunspots, we get a lot of extra particles coming towards the earth. Well, why does that matter? Hmm. Well, that matters because the earth has something around it called a magnetic magnetic field comes right from each axis out the top and into the bottom. Kind of like that. Okay. 
magnetic field? Do we have a magnetic field? Yes. Have you ever used a compass? If you take a compass outside, it always points towards which direction? North. It points north. That is because of how our magnetic field works. Now, why do we have a magnetic field? Well, we have a magnetic field because the inside of the earth is filled with a big giant ball of metal that is spinning, and it's spinning in these particles that come from the sun. These particles have a negative charge on them. When you take a big ball of metal and you spin it in something with a negative charge, you get a magnetic field. Well, why does all that matter? Well, because you know what happens. As these particles, these sunspots are coming towards the Earth, if they happen to be in this area, they actually follow the magnetic field into the Earth's atmosphere. So you've got particles from the sun coming into our atmosphere. And they bounce into, they run into the particles of our atmosphere. Well, that's kind of like bumper cars, you know? When one, one car bumps into another one and that makes the other car bump out of the way. So what you have is a bunch of particles from the sun hitting a bunch of particles from our atmosphere. So the particles in our atmosphere all start jumping around because they're getting run into by the particles from the sun. Well, when that happens, those particles give off, the particles in our atmosphere give off energy. Think about it. If you've had a lot of sugar and it makes you jump around, aren't you giving off energy? I think you are. How do we know? Because if you jump around for a long time, you get tired because you've given all of your energy off. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, when those particles are jumping around, they give off more energy than normal, which means they give off energy not in the yellow part of the visible light spectrum anymore, but up here in the green and the blue parts. Okay, can you see where we're headed with this? They give off energy in the green and the blue parts of the visible light spectrum. That's when we see the northern lights or the aurora borealis. But can you also see why we don't see them everywhere? The particles from the sun are attracted to our magnetic field right here at the pole. So the only particles that get really excited are the particles that are right up here. Or guess what? We have two poles, right? We have a north pole and a south pole. The same thing can happen down here. We don't talk about that, do we? That there can be an aurora borealis in the southern hemisphere. It's actually called the Australia's borealis, okay? Because Australia's in the southern hemisphere. So that, as those particles get excited, we see them. Now, the more particles that are coming from the sun, the more particles hit particles in our atmosphere, the more excited those particles get, the farther south we will see the northern lights. I don't know if you guys remember, maybe last week, we may have been able to see the aurora borealis because it seemed like there was gonna be a really big solar storm that gave off a whole bunch of these particles to the earth. But that didn't happen, so we didn't get to see it. Okay, but if you go to Gla Glacier National Park, if you go to Greenland, go to Iceland, the far parts of Europe, then you may get to see the Northern Lights. So that's why they happen, because the sun gives off energy. Those, it gives off energy in the form of particles. Those particles have a negative charge they're attracted to our magnetic field, just like one, a negative end of a magnet is attracted to the positive end of another magnet. When those particles hit the particles of our atmosphere, it excites them, just like you get excited when you eat too much sugar. 
And the particles in our atmosphere give off energy, just like you do when you're jumping around after you've had too much sugar. And that energy is seen in different colors of the visible light spectrum, which are the colors of the rainbow. Normally from the sun, we get yellow. In the northern lights, we get green or blue, okay? So that's why we have the northern lights. But what about the colors? If you look at the picture behind me, I, I see green, I see turquoise, I see purple. All right, I'm gonna tear this page off of here. Put that down here on the floor. I'm gonna pick that up later because as good scientists and good artists, we always keep our area neat and clean. So we clean up when we're done, right? Okay. Well, so where do the colors come from? Now, remember, we said the color happens when particles from the sun hit the particles in our atmosphere and make those particles jump around. Well, our atmosphere, our atmosphere is made up of a bunch of different elements, things that we need to survive gases that you find in the air. One of those gases is oxygen. We know we need oxygen, right? We know oxygen's in the air because we need oxygen to survive. And so every time we breathe in, we breathe in a whole bunch of oxygen. Well, if there are particles of oxygen in the lower portion of our atmosphere, closer to the ground, like down here, then those particles will end up giving off energy in the green portion of the visible light spectrum, okay? If, however, there is oxygen farther up in our atmosphere, those particles will be given off in the red portion of the visible light spectrum. So when we have oxygen closer to the ground, it, it shows up as green. Up here, it shows up as red, right? Well, what about the blue colors and the purple that we see? Well, believe it or not, most of our atmosphere is actually made out of nitrogen. Nitrogen, when it gives off color, it gives off color in the blue portion of the visible light spectrum. Okay, so those are the colors that we get in the atmosphere when our atmosphere's particles get excited by particles from the sun. All right, so. That's how the colors from an aurora borealis or the northern lights are created. So how do we draw that? It would be a fun thing to be able to draw, wouldn't it? Well, let me show you. I don't need this piece of paper. So again, I'm gonna get rid of this one. Now this paper, you might notice this, this is really thick. This is not construction paper. This is called railroad paper, all right? Um, it, it has kind of a, kind of a really nice, fabric -y feel, it almost feels like a shirt, right? Um, and it, look at how it smudges, all right? It's kind of neat to work with because it smudges really, really well. But I'm not gonna use that. Paper. I've got another piece here because if we think, if we look at this picture, in the background, we've got some trees, if the aurora borealis were to happen here, we would have mountains. So I don't want just the plain old, plain old picture. I'm gonna put some mountains in my aurora borealis. And I'm gonna use this piece of paper as the template for my mountains, okay? As the model for my mountains. And I'm gonna do that by just tearing a jagged line across this paper, that's gonna be my mountains. And I'll show you how, because that's not clear. So it doesn't matter what shape you get. Notice this paper doesn't really tear very easily, but that's okay. And again, I'm really sorry my bath is for I don't like that. Okay. Well, here's 
here is my mountain. I'm gonna set this aside, keep that. I'm gonna tear this off because I don't need this piece. I'm gonna save this for later though because I can practice my northern lights up here on this piece. Same thing with the other pieces that I put on the floor. I'm gonna save those for later because I can practice on this. Okay, now how am I gonna do mountains? Well, I'm going to take a piece of white chalk, all right? And I'm gonna hold this up to the bottom of my page. Now notice it doesn't quite fit. I've got a little bit of sun over there. I'm just gonna smudge that out, okay? It doesn't quite fit, but that's okay. And I'm gonna trace my mountain. And I'm trying to do my chalk on there pretty heavy. And notice, I'm, notice my chalk. Can you see the end, how pointy it is? That's because I'm finding that this is a lot easier to get the amount of chalk I need to get my Northern Light look if I use the side of my chalk instead of just straight on like this. So I'm putting a good bit of chalk. And look, this does not have to be perfect, which is great because I don't know about you, I can't color in the line. My sister never let me color in her coloring book. Okay, so there's my mouth. Now, I am going to take my finger and I kind of, if you notice these lights back here, it looks like the light, it's got white going up this way, okay? That's because that white comes from all of the energy that is coming from the sun being seen at one time, okay? I'm gonna take my finger and I'm gonna go straight up. This is kind of hard. I always find that I want to end up pushing to one side or the other, but you wanna really try to run your finger straight up to smudge that white chalk, okay? So I'm sorry, here comes my back because I'm actually left-handed. So it's easier for me to do this with my left hand. Sometimes I use my right hand. It's good to be able to use both. And I'm gonna run over all of this one more time. But remember, I'm just going straight up with my hand, with my finger. I'm trying not to curve it to one side or the other, okay? It doesn't matter what I have going on down here, all right? Okay, but that's not my Northern Lights. Now comes the great part. I'm going to um, draw my Northern Lights, but you don't get to use every single color that's in here. Remember, in the lower atmosphere, oxygen is gonna give us green. In the upper atmosphere, it's gonna give us red. And in the, in the middle, the nitrogen is gonna give us blue. So those are the colors that we can use. Now you can use any shade of those because as we said, the light from the sun is going to be white. And that's gonna mix in with those. But those three colors are also gonna to mix together to give us different shades of green, blue, and red. So I've done this a couple times and I'm gonna tell you, maybe it's my favorite color rather than green is kind of this little turquoisey color, but you know what? I think I'm gonna change that and I'm gonna use this bright green on the bottom today. Now, the Northern Lights, if you look at our picture, they're not straight. Because of the fact that that energy is constantly coming in from the earth, and it's hitting the particles of our atmosphere, which are bouncing around, those particles will seem to be moving. If you watch a video, it looks like the aurora borealis is actually moving and shimmering. It's because the particles in our atmosphere are moving around. So I'm not going to draw a straight line. I want my line to be curved to represent that motion of those particles. And the great thing is I can put it anywhere I want. So I can say, I'm going to start it over here. I'm gonna continue it all the way across. Now I use this 
curving line to represent that motion. But notice again, I used my chalk on the side because I get more chalk on my paper, which makes it smearier, all right? Um, and then I'm gonna do some blue for my nitrogen. And I kind of like this color, which is more of a little turquoise. So I'm gonna put this in here next. Now, remember we said these don't have to be perfect. These colors can mix together. That's completely fine. And you don't have to, you don't have to fill in everything either. And I'm gonna show you why in a minute. And then um, I also want to put in some red at the top. Um, I think I'm gonna use this color right here. It's kind of a pretty, pinkish color. Put this in. All right. But energy from the sun, when all of the energy from the sun is coming in, it's white. So I'm going to add some white now. And my white, I'm just going to put it in here. Notice I'm filling in. And can you tell, can you see the mistake I made? I kind of went too far up to the top of my paper. So when you guys are doing this, you wanna stick closer, have your mountains closer to the bottom. We'll get to see the Aurora Borealis really good over here, All right? Now, to finish my Aurora Borealis, I am going to first come in here and have these lines come all the way down because these, this light would kind of be emanating from the, look like it's hitting the earth. So I'm gonna fill those in all the way down there. I'm gonna take my finger again, and notice my finger is all covered with, colored with uh, chalk, it doesn't matter. And I'm gonna go straight up through all of these lines again, okay? Just like I did at the top of my mouth. Go straight up. Okay. Sorry, here's my back again. I'm actually going to pull my paper down a little bit. Say what I'm going to do. I'm going to get take this out of here for a second so I can get rid of those. Okay. And now I'm going to go all the way up to the top. And notice the great thing about this is that it doesn't matter how many times you go over this. You're going over this with your finger until it looks the way you want it to. So I want it to be nice and smear. I'm going to take my fingers like this too. Let me put my paper back up here. And screw this back in tight. Because the other thing you can do is take all four fingers and smear up this way. And that will smear your colors a lot more, okay? And notice then over here, I'm starting to get, this is where in the Aurora Borealis, we get colors like purple and we get that beautiful turquoise because all of these colors are really starting to blend together now, okay? So I've got some really nice colors going on in here, right here. I'm really starting to like how my green is transferring up into my pink, all right? And right over here, I've got that bright green, okay? So I love how I've got the pop of pink right there, all right? So that is my roar Borealis, but you know what? I'm missing a few stars. So I can do my stars in a couple of ways. If you have um, some water paint, some tempera paints, 
you can um, thin it out with a little water, dip a toothbrush in, and you can lick it on to the paper. I'm gonna take my chalk and I'm just gonna do this and put some stars on there. Okay, I just hit that with my finger. That's an asteroid. Okay, it's art. I can call it whatever I want. Okay, so there is my Aurora Borealis, but I'm not quite done yet because I have my mountains. Okay, but they don't really look like mountains because they don't have the features, the rock features we would see on mountains. So do you remember this piece of paper that we said don't throw away? What I'd like you to do is wrinkle this. So just blot it up and wrinkle it. This is the thing about this railroad paper. It doesn't wrinkle very well. Okay, mine's kind of tearing a little bit, but that's okay, all right? So I'm kind of just pushing it over to the side. Okay, so see, I'm really wrinkling my paper, all right? If this was construction paper or if this was white paper here, I actually have just done this to it, okay. Now I'm gonna flatten it out. I'm gonna wrinkle it just a little bit more, okay. All right, so look at how wrinkly this is. What? Kind of looks more like a mountain, but it's hard to see the features on it. So I'm going to put some tape on the back of this and I'm going to tape it back in place on my picture. Okay. It doesn't have to be a lot of tape. While I'm doing that, I'm going to tape up that place that I ripped. That's the great thing about doing a mountain. If it's got some extra little um, craggy features in it. I love that word craggy because that really describes rocks that are kind of sharp on the edges because the word craggy kind of sounds sharp, All right? If it has some extra little craggy features on it, who cares? And as far as my tape is concerned, I'm not gonna put a lot on here just to save some time. You might wanna put tape all around the outside or you can even glue your paper on. However, don't glue it flat. You only wanna glue the edges, all right? I'm only putting tape on the very edges of my mountain because you just folded it to give it all those little craggy features. We don't wanna flatten it out and get rid of all of our cragginess. Notice I'm just using the word craggy as many times as I can now because I love the word cranky. If you've ever watched Bob Ross, you've seen Bob Ross draw his happy little trees. Maybe my word is craggy mountains. I'm gonna fill in some craggy little mountains in my picture. And I'm almost ready because there's something special that I wanna show you that you can do to make these look more like mountains. So that our picture will be complete. Okay. Get one more piece of tape on here. All right, because now this will stick in place and I'm gonna put it back where it was to begin with. Now it's not gonna fit perfect because I have wrinkled it all up, but I'm only worried about the edges and getting my edges back where they belong. And see, notice I moved this edge up and it made this bounce pull out like that. That's okay, that's fine. And as you go, you might decide where you wanna put extra pieces of tape, okay? So that your mountains are held on there a little bit better. Okay, I might not put a bunch at the bottom because if you flatten it out, again, your mountains are gonna lose their rocky appearance but they don't look really rocky yet. They just look like they got a mess of chalk on them. Ooh, this is where we're gonna use our white chalk again. And we're only gonna use the side. You're gonna look at your mountain and everywhere you see that the paper is bent up, you're gonna run your chalk over that feature, 
over that line. So like right there, right here, I'm looking for any place that my paper is bent up. And that's where I'm running my chalk. Ooh, notice I got a couple at the same time right there. I got a couple right here, a couple right there. I've got one that goes all the way over there. There's another one right there. So that's all I'm doing right now is looking for places where my paper is bent up and I'm running the side of my chalk over it. You don't have to be perfect. I have some here at the bottom because the great thing about using the side of your chalk is that the paper where it's bent into a point is going to meet the side of the chalk. So you don't have to take the end like this and trace them. The paper will meet the chalk and it will trace out those lines for you. And it just goes faster that way. That doesn't mean I want my art project to go faster because then it'll be done, right? But it does make the whole process go a little bit faster. You might have more lines. I think that's pretty much all of the lines that I have. I'm gonna go over them just one more time. If I get a little extra chalk, it just kind of looks like snow. Oops. And I just dropped my chalk on the floor, so that means I'm done. All right, so now I've got this beautiful artwork in chalk. And the problem is, as you can see, is that you're gonna get chalk everywhere. My recommendation to you now would be to spray it with some hairspray and then let it dry. The hairspray will help set that chalk on your Northern Lights picture. So I hope you enjoyed drawing the Northern Lights with me and had some fun experiment with this. I have done this so many times in so many different ways. And like I said, it doesn't matter. Mine, I wish I had made my mountains a little smaller so I could see more smearing up here, but that's the way the Northern Lights are. They're unpredictable. So have fun with your project and enjoy Jam Brett's book. It's wonderful. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I just love, I gotta say, I love when you take that, um, the paper and you make the mountains three-dimensional. To me, that is just so cool. <laughs> and when you went over it with the white, it just really made it pop out. So I think that's a very successful Northern Lights landscape there. And I hope some of our participants get a chance to create one on their own and maybe even follow it along. And if you did, I'd love to see it. So I'll make sure that you get my information so that you can uh, email me your beautiful uh, pictures, or you can even tag the planetarium or the museum um, on Facebook or on Instagram or have a parent do that. And I would love to see them. And I'd love to share your creations out as well. Now I'm going to share my screen because I'm going to read to you. If you want to hang out for a minute, I'm going to read Who's That Knocking on Christmas Eve by Jan Brett. And Jan Brett does some really, really cool things with her sky. So as we read, make sure you're paying attention to all the things happening up there in the sky. So let me go ahead and share my screen once again. And it might take me just a moment so I can find that spot where we can begin here. Okay, so who's that knocking on Christmas Eve by Jan Brett? High above the Arctic Circle. In the lands of ice and snow, the northern lights shimmer in the night like a curtain of color hanging from the sky. And we can already see those crazy things happening in the sky up there. I did a little, uh, wanted you to see it up close there. We got those northern lights, just like Miss Alicia was telling us, going straight up and down. We see a lot of white in there. The air is so crisp and clear in the northern place that one Christmas Eve long ago, a boy from Finnmark on his way to Oslo with his ice bear could see smoke curling up from a hut far in the distance. He was cold and hungry, so he headed towards far off in, an, in another direction. Someone else smelled the smoke, and even though he couldn't see it, he raced off to tell the others. 
And if you look in the borders around the picture, we once again see all those beautiful northern lights of all the different colors. And Jan Bred is doing something very special where she's hiding around the borders to tell us what's going to happen next, to help us make some predictions. I bet you can guess. There's a little guy hiding over there. What's he going to be up to? Let's find out. As the boy from Denmark made his way toward the hut, Kira was inside feeding the fire that made the smoke that roasted and baked the fine food. Delicious sausage and fish and tasty buns and cakes were all laid out on the pine table. Sweet porridge bubbled over the fire and apple cider stayed cool on the windowsill. So why did Kira jump at every creek in the sod roof? And why did she run to the window when an, an icicle fell into the snow? Hmm. And if you look in the sky, we get some more predictions there. It looks like Jan Brett might be doing something with some star constellations, pretending that they're trolls. It was because in the years past on Christmas Eve, trolls came when they smelled the delicious aromas from the hut. They would pound on the door and burst until it burst open, and they wouldn't leave until they had finished up every bit of the Christmas Eve meal. No troll invasion this year, Kira's father had said. I'm going up to the mountain to watch and chase them away. And off he had gone to stop the trouble before it began. So this year, Kira was alone in the hut when she heard a soft sound at the door. Knockity knock, knockity knock. Someone was out there, but surely it was too polite to knock for it to be a troll. Kira went to the door and peeked out. Who's at the door there? There was the boy from Finnmark with his ice bear. Please let me inside to warm up, he said. I'm on my way south to show off my bear for the, for the townsfolk of Oslo. I have many frosty miles behind me and many more to go. Come in, Kira said, but I have to warn you that in years past, our house has been invaded by a pack of hungry trolls. Trolls would be a welcome adventure, the boy said. So he came in and the ice bear crawled under the warm stove and fell asleep. Here and the boy had just settled down in front of the fire when they heard, not so softly this time, knockity knock, knockity knock. There's no one home, the boy called out. He was certain it was trolls, so he pushed the chest in front of the door. There he goes. When all was quiet, Kira and the boy sat down in front of the fire again. Kira got to thinking, I wonder if the porridge is creamy enough. And she ladled a bit of, the, of it into the bowls for each of them. They had just raised their bowls when they heard a loud knockity knock, knockity knock. It was as if someone was pounding on the door with a big rock. No one at home, the boy from Finnmark shouted, and he ran to lock all the windows. It was quiet again, but the delicious smell wafted around the hut. Here it got to thinking, is the sausage salty enough? She took a piece for herself and gave one to the boy. They had just raised their forks when they heard a thunderous knockity knock, knockity knock. The hut shook and they heard a loud crack. It was the cellar trap door splintering open. Kira and the boy ran into an the animal shed and pulled the door shut just as a torrent of noisy trolls burst from the cellar. Uh-oh, another little sneak preview of what's gonna happen. There were either trolls, bug noodles, each troll wilder and more ruckus than the one before. They munched and grunted, shrieked and cackled, splashed the cider and crammed themselves with the Christmas cakes. Then when they were through, Stuffing themselves, they tumbled about, pinching each other, stamping on each other's toes, and tweaking their long snouts, which is how trolls have a good time. But through the ruckus and din, the littlest troll spied an ice bear under the stove. He took a hot morsel of sausage he had been roasting in the fire and screeched, Have a bit of sausage, kitty! And he poked the sleeping bear's nose with it. The ice bear leaped up with the tremendous nose burning terribly. Growling, he chased the little troll 
and all the big trolls around the table, up the walls and out the windows. Scratch them, kitty! Kira and the boy cheered as they watched the trolls scramble off through the ice and snow, howling. Up on the hill, Kira's father heard the shout, so he raced down on his skis. Kira and the boy watched as they scrambled off through ice and snow. Oops, sorry about that. When he saw the trolls, Kira's father could tell in an instant that they wanted to be as far away from the little hut as they could be. Goodbye, trolls, he shouted as they disappeared up through the mountain and skied home. What a fine bear you have, he told the boy from Finnmark. Thank you for scaring those pesky trolls. You must come back next year for a real Christmas Eve feast on your way home from Oslo. And they sat down for some porridge. A year later, Kira was on the mountain, gathering wood to make the fire to cook the dinner for Christmas Eve, when the little troll popped out from behind the snowbank. Missy, he called a high crackly voice. Do you still have that kitty that sleeps under your stove? Oh yes, Kira said, only she has grown up to a big cat now and she has seven kittens all larger and fiercer than herself. Ah, he screeched, then we won't be visiting your hut on this Christmas Eve. And he disappeared into a huge snowdrift. And I like to get a close up of this part as well, because once again, we see uh, what Jan Brett did here with the Aurora Borealis and she even got in there and uh, had some fun with some pretend star constellations mixed with some uh, inspired from real life constellations. So that's always kind of fun to see. I wanted to just take one more moment to thank you, to thank Alicia Robertson from the William Bush Planetarium. And if you're interested in more presentations like this and you like seeing integrated lessons and activities and uh, you just wanna get your hands messy during the long winter break, uh, visit WCMFA.org. Uh, there's all sorts of things you can find under the virtual learning section, especially if you scroll down, it's kind of hard to see, but in the Jan Brett section, we have things that you can watch and create on your own and send us your creations. So thank you all for coming. I do see that hands are raised. We don't have a way to speak to you directly right now, but if, you're, if you are wanting to ask more questions, please feel free to uh, email me or to get in touch with me. Uh, you can do it through the uh, website here, uh, or you could do it even through WCMFA's Washington County Museum of Fine Arts Facebook page. So feel free to do that. Thank you, Alicia, that was wonderful. And I'm gonna go off and try my own. <laughs> I've got to get my hands messy with some chalk today. Well, you're welcome. And if there is anybody out there who has questions that I can answer, um, I am available at the planetarium right now. Um, feel free to either email me or if you're in class right now and you have questions, have your teacher shoot me an email and we can set up a Zoom so that we can talk right now. And if you need help doing another one of these, I'm available to help you do that too. All right. That's wonderful. And I should also say, um, if, you're, if you're with your teacher or you're watching virtually um, with, your, with your class, um, my name is Kelly Neely and your teacher should be able to find me as well um, through the email. So definitely get in touch with one of us if you have any questions. And thank you, Kelly, for the opportunity. This was, this was a lot of fun. Yes, it was. Thank you and have a nice winter solstice. Bye everybody. Bye. <laughs>